All right. Hello, Facebook. This is Tommy Valentine. I am the executive director of Historic Athens. We want to thank you so much for taking some time to tune in today. Uh, this is episode 15 of 55 uh, in our series on this moment in history, COVID-19 in Athens, Georgia. And we want to start by thanking our weekly sponsor. Uh, each week of the 11 weeks of this broadcast is brought to you by a different generous local donor. Um, this week has been brought to you by by the office of Mayor Kelly Gertz. So we really appreciate the mayor's office for sponsoring this week. Uh, each uh, of our episodes so far, and if you'd like to catch up, you can just go back into the video section of our Facebook page. Um, each of our videos so far um, has allowed us to talk to a different community leader, elected official, restaurant owner, um, business owner, uh, various people to help us understand how Athens is navigating this unique often difficult historic moment. Uh, today, we have the privilege of speaking to Dr. Audrey Haynes uh, at the University of Georgia. Um, many of you know Dr. Haynes, some of you may know her work, uh, but this will be an opportunity to get to know her a bit better, um, understand how she contributes and works locally, uh, but then also to get a unique sense of how uh, COVID is affecting her life and her work at this time. So uh, with that said, we'll talk a little bit more about Historic Athens later in the program for those of you that are interested in programming like this um, and would like to know more about how to get plugged into our organization. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and have, have the unique duty of bringing online the professor who taught me about media studies. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to go ahead and bring in Dr. Audrey Haynes of UGA's School of Public and International Affairs. So. Uh, Dr. Haynes will be with us in just one moment. Hello, Dr. Haynes. Hi, how are you? Hi, Tommy. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so, uh, Audrey, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to have some viewers here who may tune in who uh, maybe they know you personally, maybe they know your work, maybe they were a student in one of your classes. Um, but uh, for those of us or those viewers that might not be familiar, can you take a moment to introduce yourself? Certainly. Um, as you know, my name is Audrey Haynes, and I have uh, been at the University of Georgia since 1999. So I have been a member of the um, Athens, Clark County, and Oconee community um, at various different times um, for over 20 years. And it's been, you know, one of the best times of my life. My children have been raised here. My um, career has, you know, solidified here. I had the great opportunity of teaching so many wonderful people and interacting with so many faculty and staff and just really learning to appreciate the amazing community that I live in. Well, you contribute to that community that, that is so wonderful and that we love. Um, I do want to go ahead and bring up this. So uh, for those of you that this is your first episode, you may not realize this, but when you comment below, um, whether it's a question, encouragement, anything, uh, we can bring it on screen. So Dan Delamater, uh, Dan and Corey Delamater sponsored our second week of this. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, the very, yes, the second week of the broadcast. Um, uh, so we love Dan and Corey. Uh, we just saw that uh, Braden and Dan are excited for today's episode. Thank you for your time. Well, Dan, thanks for tuning in. If anyone else out there as you're watching has questions for Dr. Haynes uh, and want to be included in this broadcast, you can uh, just comment below. So um, uh, Dr. Haynes, you... Uh, You've had a long relationship with UGA. You've served as a, as an educator and leader at that institution for some time. Can you delve a little bit more into your academic background and your time spent with the University of Georgia? Certainly. A, a little background. I, um, I actually was a student at the University of Georgia. I grew up um, the child of a military, Air Force um, uh, individual, and we traveled all over the world. And when he retired, he retired to Georgia. So I grew up in a very small town of Monroe County, which has actually been in the news uh, in Georgia for a little bit because they were really anxious to get back to work. And they were one of the counties that was being very vocal about that. Um, never, um, never knew that I would end up at the University of Georgia. Um, I did. Uh, my mother is from Serbia. Um, and you know, when I got here as a student, it was one of the most wonderful experiences of my life. I mean, here was a place where you could learn anything, learn to do almost anything and be surrounded with people who 
had all these different ideas and thought differently. Um, and it was, it, I always call uh, your education kind of an awakening, an awakening mm -hmm. of a lot of what's already there, but you just haven't had an opportunity to, you know, e express it, right? Or, or know that it's okay to express it, that that's an idea that, you know, is, is valuable. So um, student, uh, graduated, worked for the Girl Scouts, um, one of my favorite institutions. Uh, uh, when I left that, I got a master's and then I went on to get a PhD because I just fell in love with the notion of doing research and contributing to knowledge. And I worked at Georgia State. That was my first job after graduating from Ohio State with my PhD and luckily was able to come back to my alma mater, which is mm. not usual, yes. but it, it was a blessing. I was so lucky. Well, you know, uh, for anyone who uh, appreciates the Girl Scouts, they should tune in. Yesterday's episode with, was with Cheryl Leggett, who is the Chief Operating Officer for the Girl Scouts of Historic Georgia. So uh, we got to spend a whole episode on Girl Scouts, but I didn't know you had that Girl Scout part of your history. That's that's interesting. Um, I was a public relations uh, major and a political science minor at the University of Georgia. I wanted to go work in in campaigns. And, you know, I think I always told that story in class where I, I realized after um, volunteering and working on a national campaign in, in 1988 that I don't have the personality cut out for politics. I like to study it, but I'm not very good at doing it. Yeah. So. Although that certainly hasn't lowered your enthusiasm for campaigns. Uh, for anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to visit your office, can you talk a little bit about how your office decor uh, is uh, themed? Yeah, so when I was young, I'll, I'll tell a brief story. I've always been interested in politics. I don't know what it is. You catch this bug or you finally realize that, you know, politics has such a major impact on people. So even as a high schooler, I, I wanted to get involved. And my first involvement was because my biology teacher invited me to a political meeting mm. at the time. Um, and so I got to meet some really interesting people. And I saw that most of them were fairly normal people who just wanted to serve the public. You know, I still say that most people who want, like yourself, Tommy, people who wanted to get involved and run, they see problems and they want to help solve them. That is the most wonderful thing. Um, so uh, I've lost track of the question already. That, that well, well, I was talking what, about your office decor is pretty oh, yeah. signature. Right. So that's when I started collecting stuff. In fact, I have a Tulsi Gabbard sign in the back of my car right now that when I was driving back from South Carolina, it was just abandoned on the side of the road. So I pulled over and uh, I went out there and just grabbed it. You know, I, I don't know if that was illegal, but they're supposed to clean those up. So I think I was just helping their campaign clean up That's right. stuff because the South Carolina primary was over. So I've collected everything and then students send me stuff. I had some students who went to a Ben Carson rally and they brought back a basically four by six Ben Carson sign that they all signed for me and that's in my office, but I have a lot of campaign paraphernalia and you know, it's one of my favorite hobbies. And so people give me that stuff. Uh, I wanna bring up a few of the comments that we have here. So um, Gary and Joan Birch sponsored our first week of this program. Gary said, uh, so glad, he corrected it later. So glad Audrey uh, came to UGA, uh, favorite student, and we could talk together about Serbia and Yugoslavia. Um, so yes, Gary Spia in the house. Thanks for contributing. Gary Bird, one of my favorite professors, and he looks the same today as he did when I was his student. Yes, Gary Birch does not age. It's a it's a interesting thing. He, he, at some point, he'll reveal his secret. Um, uh, and then Shivani uh, jumped in to say we're lucky Dr. Haynes came back to UGA. So another one of my students, Tommy, and now she is in Washington, D.C., doing incredible things herself. One of the smartest, brightest, and kindest. I put a high premium on that level of kindness. Kindness is important. So, yes. um, uh, Audrey, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that I think is unique about your position is that you find yourself teaching so many people about politics, 
But each of those individuals come to you with different value sets, different um, political inclinations. They leave your class understanding how politics works better. But how do you navigate that tension between uh, educating people on political science, but also some of the partisanship that, that tends to come up during those conversations? That's a very good question. And I'm going to I'm going to give you a very honest answer. Mm -hmm. uh, part of my job is to work with a lot of different people. In the program that I run, I bring in individuals who work on, in democratic politics, who work in Republican politics, lobbyists who have to work for particular interests that they care about, companies that do the same. And the one thing that I've learned is that when we all sit together and we have a meal, which is mm -hmm. a part of what we do in the program, we bring students and we allow them the opportunity not only to hear from these individuals in the classroom, but to sit down with them and share a meal and, and conversation. Um, and what we learn is there are a lot of places where we overlap and we tend to demonize people. You're much more likely to hear what people are saying, actually saying, and understand the process and see who they are at the core. And, you know, very often you still disagree with some of their uh, ideas, just like they may disagree with, you know, some of your ideas. But at the end of the day, you, you don't find yourself just disliking someone based on an idea. You find that they are much more uh, multidimensional, that there are areas where you overlap and that they're a human being. The other thing is you kind of understand where they're coming from. Ideas don't just you know, happen. They come from somewhere. And I often tell my students that if they understand where these ideas come from, if they can articulate the ideas back to the person saying them and discuss them, that that division between them, you know, that wall may come down a little bit and you may find that there are places where you can go to make compromise. But I really feel like that's a, um, a product of my job because I, I must work with lots of people. It's very easy to be lazy and only hang out with people that agree with you all the time. Just like it, you know, we talk about this in our media class. It's very easy to get that confirmation bias from watching whatever right. media program reinforces all your ideas. But as public citizens, we should work a little harder to take in more information, whether it's directly from people or, um, you know, from news sources. But I also tell students, you can never make a change if you don't understand what's driving the attitudes of those other people. So it's a strategic thing as well. If you want to change minds, you have to understand why they think the way they do. How have you developed that worldview over time? I, I mean, how, at what point in your tenure as an educator, educator did you develop that, that concept? Well, you know, there are some people who would argue that, you know, a lot of the way we approach life and others, it comes from our personalities, that there's a part of it that is just genetic. And it's very hard to, um, you know, there's there's that. And then there's your environment. So there's a, your genetic um, predisposition to be, you know, I'm not right all the time. Have you ever met someone who they were right all the time and you wonder why do they think they're right all the time? Part of it is their personality. And then part of it is their environment. Okay, if you work in a job, especially teaching, where you learn to care about individuals. If I have a student who comes into my class who's very conservative or very liberal, um, I care about them equally. There is that, that is my mission. My mission is to teach them. Um, to teach them to think critically, to get the best information. And, you know, once you get to know students, you develop this sense that, you know, they're growing, they're learning, and you have to trust in the process of education. Um, it's not my job to change their minds. It's mm -hmm. my job to make their minds stronger, better, more thoughtful, and more resilient. And, you know, often we get into these discussions and, um, you know, I move, they move, we inform each other. And I think sometimes that is the benefit that I always say the truth is somewhere in between, hmm. right? In 
between our attitudes because there's no way that we all have all the information or all the experience. Just like with COVID-19 right now, I'm thinking about my existence over the last month. Um, I have my job. I have, um, you know, my resources. I'm 55 years old. I, I kind of like sitting on the couch and watching Netflix and Zooming with my students. I do that all the time. I'm not as affected. My feelings are not as strong. If I weren't reading the news and talking to people who are affected, it wouldn't seem as dire. But then you talk to someone who's lost a friend. You talk to someone who's lost their job, you know, and and if you have empathy and, and you listen, you realize this is a critical, serious um, crisis that needs attention. But often we're in that, you know, yeah. we're in that zone, you know, of our own experience. And part of teaching students is to get them comfortable with getting outside that zone. And sometimes you're, and I know this for me, when um, coming from Monroe County to Athens, Georgia, that was an extremely interesting uh, exposure to people who knew things and thought differently. And, um, you know, I certainly was willing to take it all in. Well, I want to, I want to, bridge what you just said with some of the comments and people that are popping up. So first of all, I do want to make sure we have Julia here who said, looking forward to having Audrey as our new next door neighbor. That That's an exciting thing. Um, uh, you know, so uh, I see Tony West, so my brother-in-law, uh, who also is an alumni of your class, uh, uh, said, Dr. Haynes certainly walks the walk, great asset to UGA and our students, one of my faves. Um, so, uh, and there's baby Duke, well, shout out to baby Duke. Um, you know, uh, Audrey, you know, when I think about the legacy that you've had, uh, I'll just I'll indulge myself and get briefly personal here. You know, uh, Dan who commented earlier, Tony, who just commented, I have very different politics from both Dan and Tony, but both of those people are, you know, two of the richer relationships I have in my life. And I think about how important what you're describing is our ability to be able to have conversations with people that we disagree with and, and empathize and also recognize the humanity in the other person we're talking to. Um, and you said that, in your opinion, some of that just comes from personality. Um, it, and you said it also seems like it comes from a, a clash of the various backgrounds you had. So you had... Uh, uh, you said you were a, a military brat. Is that right? You, you traveled around a lot through that experience. Did that shape some of your, your view on this? Oh, absolutely. I think so. My mother came from a, a, a culture and I would go visit in the summer. Mm -hmm. I would live on a farm that had no electricity and no running water. They had outhouses when I was really young. And then as my mother, um, you know, the, as, as I grew older, my, my father would actually contribute a lot to my mother's family. So they were able to build those things. Initially, they couldn't because there was no infrastructure. They lived in rural Serbia. So living in that environment and, you know, seeing, you know, how people had to struggle. My grandparents worked really hard just to make any kind of a living. And then we would go from place to place in various bases. And sometimes there'd be no base housing. And uh, this was not at a time where there were apartments. And, you know, I literally grew up living in trailer parks in some places. And you get exposed to all kinds of different people. And one of the things I think I learned coming from not a lot of means is not to be quite so judgmental of people. I, I learned to be able to talk to everybody. Um, you know, and then I also learned that education is a great equalizer. You know, I mean, I have a lot of students who come from places where they are the first generation to go to college. And then I, having taught for over 20 years, I see where they go. So when you see where they come from, a rural area without a lot of resources, with a family that may not have a significant income and, and not be able to provide as well as they could, and they go out and they get these great jobs because basically they came to the University of Georgia and they got an education and they 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 um, they learned a valuable skill and ability and they translated that and a lot of them go on to do things that are very positive and helpful to their communities. So you know 
having a lot of experience, you know, being able to, you know, have two feet in, you know, um, I live in a really nice house in a really nice neighborhood and a, in a great community. But uh, to this day, I remember what it's like to get one Christmas present. And it wasn't a great Christmas present at that. And that gives you empathy. And if you forget um, how other people live, if you, and most people live, uh, then you're not really moving towards making society better. I mean, that's the other thing, too. I, I found that the one thing I wanted to avoid in my own life was uh, hypocrisy, because I remember what it was like to have nothing. And if you have nothing, you, you always remember how it felt. So I mm. think about people today. I mean, people with, under COVID-19, there are people who can't feed their children. And there must be nothing worse as a parent to not be able to feed your children. And then all of us who have, you know, we have to do more. I mean, that is just the most important thing. And it is something that makes people feel good. And as a community, it makes you stronger, right? Mm -hmm. And it makes you, it, um, it makes us all stronger when the least of us uh, can, you know, feed their kids and pay their bills. So as we transition to the topic you just raised, the, how COVID's affecting our community, I want to just make sure we catch up because um, we obviously have lots of folks that feel passionate about you. Um, we have Lynn here. Um, Audrey is an amazingly thoughtful and articulate person. Georgia is so fortunate to have her educating its students. Lynn was one of my roommates when <laughs> I was in my master's degree, an amazing person herself. And, and then Charlene, who does many things in the community. Right now, we have the pleasure of working with her as an intern, but she'll be running the world soon. Charlene Marsh uh, said, I'm glad she mentioned the importance of empathy in education and politics. This is one of the greatest lessons she taught us in the Applied Politics Program. Uh, yes, so and Charlene another, is one of our students. stellar students. Another. So, um, Audrey, uh, one of the last times I had the chance to work with you uh, was as a TA in your online course. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately because it was a, a little bit of an experiment, the size of it, how many students were involved in it, you know, how all that was going to work. You've been now working through online education for quite some time. Ha has that helped you navigate this moment that you were already kind of ready to do that? Absolutely. Um, so quick story. My younger son, Sam, was getting ready to compete in extemporaneous speech uh, earlier this year. So he had been paying uh, and he was going to do international politics. So he had been paying attention to everything that was going on in China in December. Right. So he sends me a text. Mom, I want you to go out and I want you to buy a bunch of stuff right now. Like this is early December. So I wanted to make him feel better. So I went out and I bought all the stuff that he had put. He gave me a list. And included on that list was like Lysol wipes, all this mm -hmm. other stuff. Um, and then he got me to reading this. I pay attention to the news every day. I'm a huge news consumer. Anybody who follows me on Facebook, they probably get tired of all the news posts that are on there. But I started paying attention too. And, you know, uh, pretty much about three weeks before the university decided um, – you know, made some policy changes that we were going to transition to online. I had already told my students that if I, if they wanted to, I could go ahead and do that for them because I knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. Because if you had been a news consumer and paying attention, there's always a lag. Most Americans don't pay attention to the news. Most Americans are to, you know, go on with their lives and they're not big consumers. Um, so, you know, it has been tough. And the university did a smart thing. Uh, they gave us some time and we worked as a team. I know in our department, we all helped each other. Those of us who had been on the forefront of online teaching because we needed it. The university needs some flexibility. Students need some flexibility while they're out doing their internships and study abroad or for their schedule. You know how tough it is to schedule all your classes. To have one online flexible class in the semester makes things easier. So it was not a problem for me to transition but it was hard for a lot of people. And I will say that even though I am an advocate for online teaching, at the same time, 
it's often not the same as face-to-face. Mm-hmm. Students really miss that. We're social creatures. Um, I've had a number of phone conversations and Zoom conversations with students, and it's funny. Um, you don't think they miss you as a professor, but they actually miss you mm-hmm. as a professor, and then you miss them tremendously because you gain so much energy. You know, you've been in the classroom, Tommy. Sure. You know how much energy you get from your brains just generating ideas and 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 so on. So the University of Georgia, I'm just going to say, I feel like we've done an amazing job. I'm sure there have been things that have not been perfect because having all your classes online during a pandemic when you're stuck at home and you can't really go out and do much is not ideal. Um, but were we able to deliver? And luckily for us, we already had established relationships with our students during the first part of the semester. So you had that. Um, I had a lot of students. I did a voluntary discussion on Zoom, and um, I was amazed at the students who showed up, and we had great discussions. Um, But they're all just aching to have face-to-face again. I mean, and, and... I've heard through the pipeline that our plan is in the fall that we will be face to face. And one of the discussions that a lot of professors are having is how do we bring in those precautions? How do we how do we make our university safe? Um, And I started thinking about class sizes. I was teaching a class with 48 people in one room and everybody sitting like a foot away from each other. And, And you know how students, you know, cough all over the place. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, I was thinking about getting myself a face shield, you mm-hmm. know, uh, probably better for them. But, uh, you know, so how are we going to do it? I mean, that is going to be the real, if we're going to bring people back, uh, we need to do it in the, in the, in the best way possible. Because as a parent with a child who, um, you know, was in college, my son goes to NYU. And, you know, talk about a scary transition there. Um, right. So how do we do that? How do we go back? How do our students go back? One question I have for you. So the last semester where I TA'd with you, or one of the last semesters, uh, it was around the time of the Merrick Garland confirmation con- uh, controversy. And I remember it made for a unique educational moment because as an educator, as we talked about earlier in this interview, you're not trying to pass on your own value set. You're trying to inform how politics works, let them see the system. But you also sometimes just get candid questions that that could seem politically loaded based on what media you're exposing yourself to. So I'm wondering right mm-hmm. now, uh, this moment has not been without partisanship or rancor. You know, there's been uh, anger at the current presidential administration, anger at various political factors. Has that entered into the classroom at all? Have you been put on the spot to ask uh, why something is happening in a way that has been tough to answer? Well, you know, it is, sometimes it can be difficult, but what I've found is that um, honesty is always the best policy, even in academics. And because that's really what academics is all about, the honesty of presenting the facts and being critical and asking tough questions. And you may not like the answer, at any point in time. Um, if, even if you have your own partisan feelings, there are times where when you go after answers, your side uh, is guilty mm-hmm. of something that may not be uh, exactly on the up and up, right? Mm-hmm. Or motivated by those, you know, wonderful values. So I had, a, we had a couple of situations like that. We, we actually had a really interesting discussion about, um, the controversy about what had happened in terms of where the virus emerged Mm -hmm. and the the discrepancy between news sources and whether people believed it had been a naturally occurring virus or if it had occurred in a lab. And we had had that discussion before some of the legacy news organizations started talking about information about Mm -hmm. the lab and questions about whether it had emerged in that lab rather than the wet market, mm. uh, but had, it had transferred over to the wet market in China. And so a lot of my students who had been following that part and the, the conspiracy ship ishness mm. I can't say that word, 
um, were like, ah, see, we were right. It's in the mainstream media now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, instead of pushing back and, and going, you know, uh, no, you weren't. It's not a conspiracy, you know, or however, mine is like, well, let's talk about it. Let's go after the facts mm -hmm. because that's where I am most comfortable. I, I, I am most comfortable uh, teaching myself too and changing my view. You, you have to work at it. It's something, you know, when they say keep an open mind, it is really hard to keep an open mind, yeah. uh, especially when you've established a way of thinking about things. So, you know, that's what we do. Sometimes, too, you have students who, um, I had a student once write me a letter and, uh, you know, it was very much non-factual exposition. And the first thing I think about that is I worry about the student. You know, where are you getting your information? Are you in that echo chamber? Um, because one of the things that echo chambers produce in the end mm -hmm. is radical ideas, radicalism. And it's very hard to counter that. You know, it, it's, it, it takes a lot of effort to get someone to, you know, actually think more about facts and truth. And the and to be critical of your own leaders. And to me, that's what America is. That our freedoms are that we can, as the people, be critical of our own leaders mm -hmm. and be critical of ourselves and learn from that and figure out how we can change. Because in the end of the day, most of the young people who are in school want a better future. You know, they want a job. They they want to be able to do the things they want to do. Well, how do you do that? You know. You should be able to question your leadership and their policies, but you need to be educated on what they are, where they come from. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. It isn't easy for anybody. It's really hard to get good, accurate information. Um, whether you are someone who you know, is pro-media or anti-media, there is so much information out there, you know, both good and bad. The internet's wonderful, but it can also be the source of you know, horrible disinformation. We figured out how to fix our refrigerator the other day with the internet. But at the same time, I've also seen my friends go out there and post things that were clearly disinformation and dangerous, especially right. related to COVID. Oh, if you gargle with apple cider vinegar, uh, you will get rid of the, you're fine, right? How, how dangerous is information like that? Right. It's not. And it's always been around, but now, it can reach an audience fast and furiously and do much more damage. So in just a moment, I want to ask you a question about productivity during COVID. Um, just mm -hmm. because I know from experience, you're someone who likes to burn the candle at both ends. Um, and I know that, you know, it's like to have students who do that too. But just before I ask that question, I just want to very briefly, uh, since we are a nonprofit, thank our sponsors. So, um, I, to the two dozen or so folks that I see are already tuned in, please stick with us just for one moment. I'll make this brief because I know that Dr. Haynes is the show, but uh, I just want to <laughs> emphasize, Sorry. you know, we are a 50, no, that's fine. Uh, we're a 52 year old nonprofit. We work to celebrate and conserve community heritage here in Athens, Georgia. If you believe history is important like we do, um, if you believe that communities are better when they understand their own history, um, and if you love Athens, Georgia, uh, we'd love to have your support. Uh, you see the names and the logos on screen. Some of our annual sponsors that have supported us this year have been critical in us keeping our lights on and keeping our team moving. Uh, you can also support us as a donor member. Uh, our donor members start as little as five dollars a month. Uh, you can find out how to be a sponsor or member at historicathens.com. And I promise you, uh, while 52 years uh, gives us a lot of knowledge and and community connection. It doesn't pay our bills. Uh, we are as prone to bills as anyone else. So uh, we really appreciate any help you can give us at this time. Uh, please visit historicathens.com to find out more. Uh, thank you very much. And of course, thank you to Mayor Gertz's office for sponsoring this week. So uh, Dr. Haynes, I know that you're someone who, uh, anyone who receives emails from you knows that you work at all hours of the day and night that you are someone who works themselves very hard. How have you juggled that drive to be productive with the natural stress of a moment like this? Well, you know, it's a strange time uh, for me personally. So um, 
I told my husband the other day, I felt like I could have written an entire book so far if I'd had the time. But, you know, on a personal note, we are uh, we're getting ready to move and to move from uh, this house to another house, uh, actually moving closer into um, Athens. And uh, we've lived in this house for 20 years. So my a lot of my productivity during this time has been getting it ready because mm -hmm. it is. It is old. I don't want to leave it to anybody with, with all of the uh, activity we've had. But in, in terms of work, it's funny. We've all slowed down. It feels like summer. It actually feels like summer when you're stuck inside and you're anxious. You know, and I, I've told students this. It's hard to be productive when you're worried about a virus that can literally kill your, your grandmother. And now we find out can harm anybody and is even having an impact on children who initially were thought to be you know, pretty much immune from the virus. So it's hard to be productive when you have a high level of anxiety for some people. And I apologize. So part of getting the house ready is doing some uh, work on our yard. They're doing that now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you hear any loud noise, that's, that's going on. So uh, sorry for that. But, um, you know, I, my, my advice and my own thought is if you are getting the basics done during this time period. If you have one day of excellent productivity, you're doing fine. You know, this is a, this is a once in a lifetime moment. And, you know, uh, it is not easy. I've seen my, you know, both of my children doing their classes um, and, you know, how difficult it is to stay in one room where your Wi-Fi spot is decent and, you know, get it done without having the break of talking to your friends or, you know, going to a movie or going out and just having a conversation with someone. And again, we, I had book club um, the other day through zoom, hmm. not, not the same, you know, very Saturday night live through uh, zoom, not the same. Um, so I, I think depending on people's ability and personality and where they're at, um, you know, uh, they, some may be more productive. My, my focus was getting my students through the process and making it as, as good for them. So whatever it took, I did. I have spent a lot of time on the phone and, and zooming and, you know, writing people, encouraging notes um, and then doing things. And I'm glad I've had stuff to do. You know, if you had something like work like this, it really took your mind off of the worry. Uh, but again, I think there's a lot of anxiety if you're worried about whether you're going to get paid and, you know, you are a local server. Athens has so many bars and restaurants and clubs and stuff. And those people, the students aren't here and it's really difficult to make a living. Um, you know, that's a different type of anxiety and being productive when you're worried about your next meal is really hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's a really tough question. I mean, like I said, I like to be productive, but I am in a unique situation where I could be productive. I think it's really hard for others right now. Um, and we're all just doing the best we can to get through it. And, and everyone's hopeful. That raises a point too. I, you know, the governor is lifting the ban. Um, and today is the day the ban, I think, is lifted, right, Tommy? No, um, and the shelter in place. That's right. The shelter in place. And, you know, I noticed yesterday I had to run to the store. Um, there seemed to be a lot more people out. People are waiting for someone in authority to tell them it's OK and that they can go on. They want to go back to that normalcy. And it also that shows you the power of government. Right. It shows you the power of leadership because, you know, everyone's feeling confident, even though there's still some question about will there be another spike, you know. But to me, that moment I was thinking about, wow, it's interesting as citizens how that is going to have such an impact on our behavior that, you know, one person or one small group of people making that decision about is it safe and how can we proceed? Um, so that's the other thing I will tell you, uh, if you didn't value government and if you didn't value competence in government and experience, um, this may be a time where you're thinking about how valuable that is and how important your vote is, mm. how important it is to know the people that you elect and not to make your decisions based on, you know, crafty commercials and, you know, innuendo or 
any kind of, of advertising, find out how much experience they have, Mm -hmm. you know, find out, you know, um, if they are likely to choose good people to work in their, in their cabinet, because boy, does it matter, right? We are at a time where literally lives depend on the quality of leadership we have. And we should, that should be one lesson we take from this pandemic is that as citizens, in a democracy, we need to pay attention to what we're doing and think very critically about the choices we make in the voting booth. One of the themes of the earlier part of our interview was the idea of empathy. Um, you know, empathy as an educator, empathy when talking to people with different types of politics. Uh, how has your natural and honed empathy uh, affected your uh, the way you've interacted with this moment? Well, I tell you, it has really made me try and look at both sides of every coin. So I understand, in fact, I was just talking to someone about, you know, my disappointment that in our very polarized uh, polity right now, that Mm -hmm. we continue to do so even during a pandemic. And the discussion of, you know, uh, bringing back the economy has become an issue of the right and they own that issue. And that's what they're, you know, working on and that, you know, health and safety and welfare and the, the new, the new pro-life movement belongs to the left because they are so concerned about that issue. And now we're fighting over it as, as though it's a choice. It's not really a choice. We need to be able to do both. We need to somehow figure out how we can, maintain and protect individuals while also, you know, there's a reason we call it a livelihood, right? Mm-hmm. Because it is what allows us to live. We, that's the nature of our, um, our society, this, this notion of an economy and, and so on. And people aren't talking to each other. You know, one of the things I, I would have liked to have seen um, you know, when the governor made up the move to open up, um, I understand, you know, a lot of his motivation. I read the entire, you know, uh, 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 declaration that was coming out of his office policy wise. But let's have a group of people social distanced. But let's have um, the mayor of Atlanta. Let's have Kelly Gertz, our mayor uh, in Athens. Let's have all of those people. Let's have Rusty Paul. Right. Let's have everyone together and come up with a unified plan. And it may be different Mm -hmm. for cities than it is for rural areas, but get all those voices in there. You know, we talk about collective action in class and, you know, in a polarized polity with polarized government, this is the time they need to set that aside. And, you know, I would argue that I don't think anyone um, wants anyone to be harmed. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, and wants anything bad to happen to anybody, either economically or health-wise. But you really need to have those individuals together and you need to show that united front. Boy, that would do a lot to bring up public confidence in government because it's not very high at this moment. People are disappointed and they are, I think they're very let down by the government response from the highest level to, you know, you know, the, the state level and it varies city by city and county by county. Right. So, you know, again, the lessons learned from this pandemic, I think uh, will be lessons about governance, communication, messaging, the negative role that Uber partisanship can bring uh, with this polarization, getting information, disinformation, all of those things. Dr. Haynes, I have a question for you. I'd like to lay out just your opinion. So a great deal of our time and attention as Historic Athens over the last few months has been spent trying to help folks understand how Athens has navigated moments like this in the past. So um, I urge anyone who's interested in that subject to go on the Red and Blacks website. Um, Two years ago, they did a retrospective on the 1918 flu in Athens. It was like a hundred year retrospective, excellent piece. I think the author was Rebecca Wright. Uh, But in any case, uh, one of the things that's opened my eyes to is how rarely 
in history when we're, or even in political science, when we're talking about events that shaped America, we mm-hmm. or, or the United States, we rarely talk about the role that pandemics or, or, or widespread disease plays, you know? So for, for example, as much as I've studied history and politics, I didn't realize quite the scope of the 1918 flu. And all of a sudden, all these other world events, the Roaring Twenties, uh, kind of the, the way that people were in the Twenties made more sense than relying on, let's say, World War I alone. Uh, mm-hmm. Since then, it's become clear that there's all there's been so many events like this. There was an event in the 50s or, where you had a pandemic. It just seems to me like when we're telling our stories, we're comfortable telling the military events, the battles, the wars, changes of power, important leaders. Uh, but it seems like when we're reflecting on world events that shape our politics, that we're almost afraid to talk about disease. And so when you talk about lessons learned, I'm hopeful that there are lessons learned, but I'm wondering if if you either agree with this premise, have noticed this premise before, or if you have any thoughts on why when we're reflecting on our shared history, we don't talk about the way that disease changes our world? Well, you know, that's a really good question. And, uh, you know, first I'd preface it by saying that most people often don't even think about the lessons of history. Mm -hmm. They're so focused on now and the immediate uh, activities and current events that even things that happened 10 years ago, I mean, think about what happened in 2008 and, you know, Mm -hmm. other events. They're long forgotten. And there are people who are also actively trying to, you know, shift attention away from those because they have perhaps their own agenda. Oh, we don't want to, we don't want to fix that because if we fix that, it's going to affect us in this area. The other thing too is, you know, in when I teach propaganda, there are some things out there. People don't like disease, you know. Uh, in fact, um, President Trump supposedly is really good at using something called disgust triggers. When he like talks about other people, he'll, he'll make fun of them in a way that points out something that is disgusting. And often that may have to do with um, disease, right? So you when you when you talk about anti-immigration, for example, you don't talk about, you know, um, and you don't want to seem like you are someone who is anti-immigrant or you know, uh, xenophobic or whatever, you say, you know what? Great people, but they're going to bring disease to our country. So there's this disgust trigger that's utilized because Mm. naturally people don't like disease. We don't like to think about disease and that other thing that starts with a D that is associated with disease, death, right? Mm. Where, so when you think about people who, um, who write, you know, history, one, we like to avoid those topics, you know, as soon as, we're, you know, and we like, we forget, right? I mean, think about the last time you were sick and had something really horrible about, you know, yeah. whatever. It doesn't stay with you. You you move forward, you know. Um, the other thing is history books, uh, especially in, uh, you know, course books, they're very limited, right? And it's like you, you stay with the traditional stories, the big policies, because you have that Think about the textbook we used when you were my most awesome TA. Can I just do a plug for Tommy right now, live? And that is, I don't think I've ever had a TA who was as phenomenally connected to students or who worked as hard. And that's why everything he does, he just makes amazing. And, and talk about empathy. I mean, they loved you because you you are so connected to them. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that out there. Um, you. But um you know, I mean, back to our, our textbook, very limited, you know, 30, 40 pages in a given area. So one, we don't like to talk about it. And two, it's 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 not as fun, you know, I mean, but do communities learn lessons if you are affected by a pandemic uh, multiple times, as we see has happened um, in various parts of Asia, they change the way they live. Um, mm. You know, little things like uh if you have public transportation, I think in Singapore, they have handrails that are, you know, anti-micro, what am I thinking? Um, they, yeah, they, I, they, they, anti-microbial, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that, yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, 
Yeah, without lecturing all the time. I'm a little out of practice in talking, you know, so my kids don't want to talk to me. I don't know why, right? Um, so, uh, you know, um, wearing masks in public. I mean, it's weird here in this country, there's almost a stigma. Um, I was out wearing my mask, I'm 55, and I have an 80 year old mom, and you know, I'm careful. And uh, somebody made a comment about my mask. And I thought, God, wh why would they do that? Mm. You know, I mean, don't they realize that the part of the reason I'm wearing this is to protect them, mm. right? So those attitudes that are out there, um, that, that goes, um, you know, to the messaging too. I think we get so much messaging that uh, at this moment um, is not always helpful and not always accurate. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit about history, but think about how the way people think about this pandemic is being shaped at the moment by this discourse. Hmm. Um, that's pretty amazing to me too, that it's not, you know, united we stand, divided we fall. Right. It's like those guys are whiners and they're overreacting. And, you know, these guys don't care about life and, you know, again, bifurcated. Yeah. That would be another reason that, you know, people don't talk about it. Maybe it's because, um, you know, historically we don't handle these pandemics very well, do we? Right. I mean, and government yeah. is often caught, uh, you know, even though they should be prepared and we've had all the warnings, we still, we still don't do it. It's almost like what humans do, right? You, you have a heart attack, but you go back to, some people go back to eating the potato chips and drinking mm -hmm. their whiskey. And then some people change the way they behave. I mean, we're, human beings are really weird about things like that. So I want to transition very quickly uh, to, because uh, we have about five or six minutes left together. Um, just to the, the three questions we've been asking each of our guests. I do want to mention, so uh, I appreciate Gary chiming in to say uh, very kind words, a lot of wisdom shared today. Thank you, Audrey and Tommy, Gary and Joan. So thank you, Gary and Joan. Uh, we love you both. Um, you. So, um, and, and you know, uh, Audrey, you just mentioned three or four different threads in your last comment that I'd love for us to go down if we had more time. But I, I will say that uh, the sense that even with advance warning that, uh, or even with the potential threat that this catches us unaware each time is just so fascinating. And there's there's a lot we could talk about there. Um, I will say, uh, as far as these, these final few questions, so the first question is a bit light, but one that I wanna capture nonetheless. So if you were assured tomorrow that you didn't have to shelter in place anymore, that you could go out anywhere and that every business you know and love was open again. Uh, what would be some of your first stops tomorrow? Restaurants, bars, retail stores. What, what, what would be some of the first places you'd go? Well, I, you know what I crave more than anything is like a typical day. I want to get in my car. I want to go to work. I want to see all the people I work with. Because luckily for me, I've gotten to see my family every single day for mm -hmm. the last month. And it's actually been a pretty positive experience. But um, I want to go to my office. I want to say hello to everyone. I want to teach in a classroom. I, I want to I really want to hug people. Mm. You know, that's that's something we haven't been doing. And I don't think we'll be doing for a while. I yeah. think for most of us, we will avoid that close content contact. And I and I remember after 9-11, remember, it took about two and a half years for the airlines to get back up to speed because mm. we are slow to engage in those things. But then I want to walk downtown. I want to do that North campus stroll and see all those students doing really cool things. I want to see someone kicking the hacky sack. And, and then I want to, you know, I want to walk over to Jittery Joe's or Starbucks and get some coffee and, you know, just smell the coffee grounds and then walk downtown to one of my favorite restaurants. And there are a lot of them. I mean, they're all great. And then maybe go into a store and stand around and look at stuff that I could actually purchase. Um, but just being out with people, I'm sure that must be the answer. Everybody's saying it's like, I like people, you know, I like my friends, yeah. but I just like the bustle of people. It yeah. gives us life and energy. And especially on this campus, the University of Georgia, I mean, everyone who is an alum knows that when you go and you're hanging out anywhere on campus, 
it's full of life, right? And you feel hopeful and you feel invigorated and, and there's just nothing better. Yeah. Well, and I'd like to take my 80 year old mom out shopping who's been stuck in the house for months and is afraid to go out. But I would love if everything were normal, just to take her out to Barnes and Noble and, you know, look at some books and magazines and then just go shopping. Cause I mean, I feel like she's been very isolated and we forget about our elderly. Yeah. I mean, they're the ones who are really suffering during this pandemic. When you talked about the North campus walk that you do, I think about how often I've run into you by the UGA arch. And okay. so, uh, and so I, that's a good transition into my second to last question here, which is, uh, so, you know, part of what Historic Athens does, and we do a variety of things, but one of the things we do is historic preservation. And uh, in the historic preservation community, I know one of the concerns I've heard is that when you come out of a recession or you come out of a large event like this, sometimes you have reckless development, uh, you know, building just for the sake of building and previously safe historic places can become endangered. So we're trying to remain on the balls of our feet and be ready for that moment if it should come. My, where that's a question to our guests is if someone is tuning into this interview 50, 60 years from now, or some uh, future SPIA professor is looking at it 100 years from now, what are some of your favorite historic places in the Athens area, ones that you hope that they might still be able to go to? Well, almost, uh, you know, one of them is, you know, Baldwin Hall, one of one of our, which has a really interesting history, some of it very sad, too, in mm -hmm. terms of, um, you know, the, the history of the building and where it's at and what it's built over. But, you know, places like the chapel, I mean, I know that we're always growing and building new buildings, but I always am amazed that we love and care for a lot of our older build buildings. Um, I actually was an RA in one of the older dorms, Rutherford, and it was renovated. And mm -hmm. um, you have renovation. But at the same time, when you lose a lot of the sort of the material that makes it historic and different, you know, um, yeah. that always makes me sad. And it, a lot of people look at the, some of the development downtown, um, especially some of the high rise student living and and, you know, I, I understand it's necessary, but I hope that there's always some balance there because, you know, downtown is such an interesting place and it's lovely. Uh, one of my favorite stores that I shop for with my boys is called Kempt. It's like a men's clothing. Mm -hmm. And those yeah. Yeah. Young, young people really tried very hard to maintain the historic integrity mm -hmm. and the beauty of their, their, their building. And that made me very happy because those are young people who appreciated the art of it. I mean, yeah. the, the, the beauty of it, because it is art. Historic Athens is, is art in a way. And you want to preserve the lines and the beauty of, of those just for your for the enjoyment of our, our children and, and their children's children. So thank you, Tommy, for what you do and for thank everyone historic Athens. I mean, isn't that what makes Athens sort of the classic city is we have the elements of new and, and old in a good way. Right. Right. And you want, again, like everything, you want to maintain that balance. You need that balance. That's right. Uh, well, yes, the, the art of Athens is one of the reasons so many of us can't find a way to leave for sure. So, uh, with, uh, our last question here, uh, Oh, wait, Amy says Rutherford wasn't renovated. It was torn down. Yeah, I was trying to be a little nice. I really did <laughs> I really miss that. I, my dorm room in Rutherford, it was so it was like 14, 14 feet high. It was a beautiful building. So when I when I saw it, I was a little sad. Thanks. Yeah, it is, is that, <laughs> thanks, Amy. Yeah, and it yeah. is that, yeah, that it's losing things like that that we want to avoid. Um, so uh, my last question that we want to preserve here is uh, once again, thinking to those future generations that might be interacting with this interview once we contribute it along with the other 55 to Hargrid and our local libraries and research institutions. Uh, if you are if you were talking to someone a hundred years from now, 
what would you want them to know about Athens in this moment? Well, I always say Athens is a classic city. I mean, it is, it's a real community made up of a lot of people who care about the area a great deal. And people don't want to leave. They want to stay and they want to build it and, and maintain it and keep the elements that are uh, meaningful and beautiful. Uh, while at the same time progressing in terms of ideas and, and new innovation and new inventions. So again, all about balance. I mean, that's what a classic city is. Progress and, and, and understanding of the value of that which has already happened, the history, and mm -hmm. how valuable the two are together. You really can't progress unless you understand your history and, and in some ways, you know, maintain your knowledge of it. Absolutely. Well, um, Dr. Haynes, thank you so much for spending all this time with us today. Uh, uh, we really, uh, I encourage anyone who's not connected with uh, Dr. Haynes to seek her out online. She's phenomenal. She's a real in incredible resource for us to have locally. Um, and uh, to all of you that are uh, tuned in today, we will be back on Monday at one o'clock. Uh, this, this interview series takes place every weekday at one o'clock until June 26th. Um, and so we look forward to next week and next week's interviews. Uh, besides that, Dr. Haynes, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Tommy. And, and thanks to uh, all the people who, uh, including you, work with you to, to maintain that balance that we need. Of course. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone who tuned in and uh, contributed to today's discussion. Lots of uh, warm and positive feelings about Dr. Haynes, which is no surprise. So uh, uh, Audrey and I are going to go offline at this time. Thank you to all of you. Stay safe, stay healthy, treat your weekend like a weekend. Um, and uh, we'll see you back uh, on Monday at one o'clock. Thank you very much. Have a great day.